bother me, let's shut down. It's the only life I know. Tell me where will I go? Tell me where will I go? And the only tune I hear is the sound of the wind. As it blows through the town, weave and spin, weave and spin. We had grown accustomed to the noise of the textile mills, like crickets on a long summer night. The sound of the whistle before the shift change was so familiar like the call of a songbird. Life in a southern mill town had its own pulse, its own rhythm. Over the years, the silence of idle mill machinery grew slowly until it was a roar. The collapse of Pilotex operations in Kannapolis was a major turning point and a losing cause foreign competition had taken its toll. Our cotton mill life is dying, but the remnants of fabric are still here, behind the glass and steel of our new South Cities. This program is a tribute to the hard-working women, men, and children of the mills. During the next hour, you will see the work of historians who have documented this lost way of life. Our textile mill heritage lives on in museums, music, literature, the theater, on the internet, and in some places you might not expect. In the late 1800s, as new railroads opened up the backcountry south, textile mills sprang up, first by the dozens, then by the hundreds. One reason that lots of cotton mills opened in the Carolinas was that lots of cotton was grown in Carolina fields. Cotton and cotton mills, they're a big part of Southern culture, and they're celebrated every year during cotton ginning days. The Cotton Ginning Days Festival in Dallas, North Carolina is an annual tribute to invention and ingenuity. The festival features old engines and machines that made for greater productivity on the farm or in the factory. It's history. That's what it is, it's history. And you know, they got those old saws that runs off those one lungers. Those old engines, it hits every once in a while. We've got a lot of old engines, old boat motors, you name it. If it's old, we have old guys around here too, as a matter of fact. Well, a lot of them either worked with these uh, machines in, in their careers or uh, worked with their father or grandfather uh, when they were growing up with these old machines and it's a nostalgic uh, trip for them to see them working again in the original condition that they might have seen them working. The very first celebration of Cotton Ginning Days was observed in 1987. The show has grown from 28 exhibitors to over 300. Crowds have swelled to 30,000. All men like old engines and steam engines and tractors. And I guess all men do, I do. <laughs> My favorite tractor is a John Deere. I call it green, it's my favorite color. It draws a lot of people. It's very popular. Well, our crown jewel is the uh, cotton gin, the uh, Lankford cotton gin powered by the Wilson diesel engine. The cotton gin is a marvel and was certainly hailed as a miracle when it was invented by Eli Whitney in 1793. Separating the seeds from the fiber was a time-consuming task. Mom, you ever seen this dirty cotton? Look here. It took all day for one person to clean one pound of cotton. The cotton gin or engine could remove the seeds from 50 pounds of cotton in a day. Up until that uh, invention of the cotton gin, the cotton 
fabric was a cotton of kings and very wealthy people. And they were the only ones that could afford it because of the immense labor that went into to making the fiber uh, available for, for textile. When Whitney's invention was pirated and reproduced without his permission or profit, its widespread use made southern landowners rich. Cotton became a major cash crop, and the need for slave labor, which had actually declined in the 1790s, increased dramatically. The cotton gin changed the course of history, and its inventor, Eli Whitney, went on to develop a modern system of manufacturing which was key to the rise of the textile industry in the South. The Gas and Agricultural Mechanical Textile Restoration Association was founded uh, with the mission of uh, restoring and collecting the old equipments and preserving the heritage of that industry uh, in Gaston County. There's a lot of women go. My wife goes every, every time I go. She likes it. Load up the van or the pickup truck or whatever and, and come on out to Cotton Ginning Day. We'll treat you so many ways, one of them's got to be right. There's power in water for baptism and for industry. In the late 1800s, cotton mills sprang up along the fall line of North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Virginia. The current in the South Fork of the Yadkin River is swift, and at just the right spot, a few miles down Highway 108 from Greasy Corner, natural falls drop 18 vertical feet. The Dukes of Durham saw this potential for power and profit. They purchased 3,000 acres of land and built a large textile mill and an entire town called Coolamy. Hundreds of people moved to the growing community to work in the mill, which began running in 1901. They gave up their independence on the farm for a new way of life. Yet I think that, that they would say they did well uh, by making that change. So they rebelled against it for a while. Lynn Rumley is one of the founding members of the Coolamy Historical Association. She's the director of the Textile Heritage Center, North Carolina's first museum dedicated to cotton mill culture. The Southern cotton mill people, they need a monument. They need something to be remembered by. At the Textile Heritage Center, you'll find photos, exhibits, books, and over 100 hours of videotaped interviews with longtime residents. Well, it was just like a family here when we was growing up. Everybody knew everybody in town. People were very, uh, very proud of the work that they put out. We had one of the best baseball teams in the state. And we was proud of the ball club. We had some good people on it, too. We went to the Detroit Tigers, Grimes Parker to the Philadelphia Athletics. Jim Rumley, Lynn's husband, is also a major player in the history of Coolamy. He researched and wrote a 448-page book on the history of the mill town. Lynn is also a writer. She wrote a grant proposal that was awarded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. The grant will help to ensure that the work of the Coolamy Historical Association will continue. It was a 25-page narrative, and several other people edited it. And because I didn't finish high school, I'm not uh, I'm a more self-educated person. The good folks of Coolamy know that their legacy of hard work has to continue. A large mural painted on the side of the mill is a tribute to their disappearing past. It depicts the town square, which was destroyed in 1963. The mill closed down six years later. But Coolamy has another project to commemorate its past. This community of only 1,000 residents has raised over $1 million to buy property for a waterfront park. Whether there will be water flowing through the park is up for debate. In 1995, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission granted a license to a company to divert the water for hydroelectric power. We started petitioning the, the federal government and the state government, and our organization was sued by the power company for petitioning the government. With the outcome uncertain, 
The community is hopeful that a compromise can be reached and that the river will continue to flow as it has for centuries. One thing is certain, the passing of time. Lynn Rumley knows that the direct links to the past, like the roads on an old map, are fading. When this generation is all gone, um, that we, we, there will be nobody to ask questions of. I started working uh, when I was 14 years old. I don't think that the, the people today take pride in their work as much as they did then. I'm sure they're looking down and smiling because uh, they would want people to know how they grew up. Oh, I think so. I think so. We try to try to tell the people, but you know, it's hard. These young children coming up now, it's hard to teach them anything. We had a river, which was not too far from here, and then we spent a, we were growing up, we spent a lot of time at the river. Mm -hmm.